Welcome to YAF Talks 3, featuring Jackson Andrews Building and Design, put on by AIA Hampton Roads and YAF 757. This event and others like it would not be possible without our sponsors, so we'd like to take a quick second to thank our Gold Level sponsors, Irvin Architectural Products and Marvin Windows, Hanbury Architects, Jackson Andrews Building and Design, and Altruistic Design. Our Silver Level sponsors, S.B. Ballard Construction Company, Carlisle Wide Plank Floors, European Architectural Supply, Lighting Virginia, and Orbis Landscape Architecture. Our Bronze Level sponsors, Time Off Moss Architects, Gov Solutions, Shaw Contract, and Egovative Energy. Our YAF Talks 3 committee was made up of people from the firms B. Grace Design, Clark Nexon, Dills Architects, Clarity by Nella Walls, and Ionic Design. And a special thank you to our AIA Hampton Roads annual sponsors, Clark Nexon, SPC Structural Engineers, McPherson Design Group, Pella, Lynch Mike and Structural Engineers, Yuzhu Zhen Photography, and Business Document Solutions. Thank you. Okay, um, October 19th, we have intro into home raising. It's going to be at Via Architecture. If you live around here, you're aware that we need to raise some of these houses. So that's October 19th. You can go on our AIA website to learn more about that. October 20th, Kevin's going to have a hard hat tour for us at the new Virginia Beach City Hall that's Building 1 at the Municipal Center in Virginia Beach. And November 11th will be our AIA Hampton Roads Design Honor Awards. We will be at the new assembly building in downtown Norfolk off Granby Street. It's 400 Granby. It's also the home of WPA and Lynch Mikens. If you haven't been there yet, it's pretty awesome. We also have in November, we have the ARCX is back. It's not back fully in person yet. It's going to be November 1st, 3rd, and 4th virtually. And then on the 5th, Friday, November 5th. We're going to be live up in Richmond, so if you guys want to make a trip up there, go to AIAVirginia.org to sign up for that. Yeah, so we have two out of four of this year's AIA Virginia ELA class. Babs, can you stand up? So we have Babs. And we have Aroda. She's back there. Virginia picks 16 rising architects every year for their ELA program. This year from this area we also have Gary from Hampton University as one of our student representatives and we have Ashley Montgomery from Canberry is also part of the class of ELA. They'll be presenting on day one of ARCX November 1st and again that's virtual so you can buy a ticket and tune in just from your computer. If you want to be part of ELA 2022 uh, submissions are due next week on October 22nd to our chapter, to AIA Hampton Roads. If you want to apply to the state, you have until November 5th to get in your submissions, and that's uh, at AIA Virginia. And then tonight, we want to thank the people responsible for making the ACT Talks happen. We have a small but mighty committee this year. It's myself, Kelly Batchelder from Nella Wall Systems. We have Chris Warren, uh, previously with Ionic, this week with uh, Clark Nixon. <laughs> They finally wore them down. So. <laughs> and uh, we have Natasha that all, is doing our photography. Natasha from Joe's Architect. <laughs> and again, we have Babs <laughs> from New Grace Design. If you haven't heard, Babs started her own architecture and design firm right before the pandemic started. So, And she's still killing it, even with the pandemic. So check out Be Grace Designs. Also, one last thing from AIA and YAP is if you would like to volunteer, we are always looking for volunteers to join the board for 2022. Chris will be our president next year. Woo! So it's going to be fun. And um, if you can't commit to a full year, we also always take volunteers for the committees. So thank you very much. Yeah, everyone, thanks for coming out tonight. Just want to say one more thing. We are always at the AIA looking for annual sponsors. We have multiple levels of sponsorship that you can sign up for. You can go to our website, AIAHR.org, and look those up. Um, so with that being said, let's give a warm round of applause for Jackson Andrews.
thank you all for you know, having us here tonight. This is, uh, this is the first for, for me and for our team. I wouldn't sure what to make it tonight, but this is, this is an incredible turnout. And honestly, there are a lot of things we can talk about, and I think it all comes back to one topic for us. It's going to be collaboration. Um, it's been something that I think I can only speak on my experience. Um, I can't speak for every builder, but I've seen a lot of consistencies from my role as a builder as well as other builders in different markets and our market, so I'm really happy to kind of share on that. But I'm excited to share a lot about where our team is, and I think that starts with the where we came from. I want this to be really transparent. The best thing I can do is be honest um, with my team, with our clients, and with you all, and with our trades. And so that's kind of where we kind of start with, with honesty. Um, I have enough going on in my head to keep up with between work and employees and clients and family that the last thing I need to do is try to keep up with smoke and mirrors or quotes. And so we just we kind of have this baseline of honesty. So to be completely honest with you guys, I had this great speech lined up and, um, and, and, and it was gonna be incredible, awesome, <laughs> and, and that's all we're gonna do. But y'all already eaten up an hour and a half of my talking time. So <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on the fly with this a little bit. But um, honestly, for y'all's sake, I really hope this becomes collaborative. And it goes back to what we're hoping for this evening is, and not just this meeting, but moving forward. And that's what my team is desiring in our industry, is collaboration. And I think it's uh, it's been missing, at least from my perspective here locally. Um, my team, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna spend too much time on where we've been. I more wanna just focus on where we were going and where we've recently kind of changed from. Um, but to do that, I think it starts with my team. And my team really is an incredible group of people. And that is what makes up Jack Green Facility Design. Um, and when I talk about JAB, we're going to establish that right now. JAB Senior Interest Building Design is JAB. I get a lot more done tonight if we just go with that. <laughs> so, um, but, but JAB is a group of people. And when I started JAB back in 2012, um, it was, you know, I had a couple goals that really led me to go out of I had the opportunity to work for another reputable builder in the industry here in Virginia Beach. And I learned a lot. But ultimately, I wanted to essentially have a process. I saw what was lacking was. I saw clients losing control of the process of the building. I think this is an intimidating process to build a home or to renovate a home. For many people, it's the most inconvenient experience they'll go through. And I, I saw a need to make this as convenient as possible. And so for me, this was someone, something I wanted to create a home. We are heavily, heavily customer service based in what we do. Everything we do comes back to customer service. No matter what we're building, um, it comes back to customer service and the whole experience the client has to go through from whether it's the design through the building process. And so that's kind of how it started. Um, was I really wanted to get into the customer service side of it. I had a passion for building. Um, I didn't really have a background in design, to be fully just transparent with you all. Um, I had a background in sweeping floors and uh, that grew into framing. It grew into a little bit of carpentry and it just grew into a passion of this whole building process and I had a lot to learn on the design side. I had the opportunity to get into the industry with design build, and I think that we can use design build as that phrase in a number of different scenarios. It can be design and build, which I think is a really healthy way to look at this. It can be design build, where it's kind of under one umbrella. If I got to choose some industry and design build under one umbrella, and it was great, and I, I learned a lot, um, and I got into the industry in 2009, which was kind of the worst time to get into the industry, which is probably why all I was capable and got hired to do was to sweep floors. Everyone needs somebody to clean up their job sites. But um, as I got into it, the more I fell in love with it. And I got to see the design process happen under one roof, I got to see the build happen under one roof. And I got to see a little bit of a transformation kind of go through as we kind of came out of a really rough season in our economy and building industry. And one thing I noticed was plans. When I first got in, I'm glad I started when I did. I think if I started six months later, I would have missed this. But plans went from being this thick, becoming this thick, to becoming this thick, to becoming, it really was the, hey, how little do we need? How much do we need to build a permit? I'll go ahead and get to my confession here. So I've been part of the problem. Um, and as I began to go out on my own in 2012, um, my, where I didn't help the design side of the industry was I was answering questions from clients that may have called me of what do we need? 
And that was, well, we need an elevation. We might get a roof plan. We need a floor plan. I just really, I just need a wall section. And I can draw it if you needed to, but I just need a wall section. It doesn't even go to what the cladding is. It just needs to say cladding. And I think a lot of design builders, as well as builders in general, really hurt in this whole collaboration of the design and the build process. And I didn't realize that probably until, I mean, I went on my own in 2012 and in 2019. So I did a lot of damage in seven years as I look back on how, how I look at it. I think the incredible impact on customer service and transparency and, and potentially providing an incredible experience for clients in building care homes, but we didn't, we could have provided a lot more. And so in 2019, I had the opportunity, actually thanks to an architect, is where this kind of came from. This is really getting back to the, the mindset of collaboration. And an architect in 2019 that I, um, thanks to Rick, I'm not a big Instagram guy. Um, I'd much rather focus my time on clients or our team. Rick made it a really big point that you know, there's, there's an impact with social media. But I had an architect reach out to me in 2019 um, as we had just began to get into social media. Um, he said, hey, I know you're going to be coming to IBS, the International Builder Show this year. So when you're there, we want you to come to this dinner. I had no intention of coming to IBS. The idea of walking around conference centers in Vegas and seeing this was just the last thing I wanted to do. The team knows me pretty well. But of course, I responded with, of course, I will be at IBS. Um, and uh, I would be ecstatic to come to this dinner and to get to, to Meet with you guys. And it, was a, it was a dinner that was being set up with, uh, being really headed up by an architect out of Boston. Um, and this guy, we had been following for a long time. If y'all like don't, I recommend you do. Um, his name's Steve Basic. And I think what he is doing is he has a background in the building science part of the industry, uh, but he really does a good job of kicking builders in the butt to build homes that are going to last and stand the test, test of time. And um, so we had been following this guy. And, we came out, as, you know, of course, that same night, he was like, well, I guess I'm going to IBS, and told my wife, that, hey, by the way, I'm going to Vegas in a couple weeks. Um, <laughs> it was work-related. And, uh, and I went out there, and my my mind completely just was transformed with this, this, this concept of collaboration, more than we had been participating in the past. Um, and when I came back, um, and I know Rick was really already ex excited for this, it was this idea that we've got to learn, we've got to learn to collaborate and know that we don't know it all. And really that, that kind of kicked off this series for us. So back in 2019, we've been functioning much differently than we have the last nine years. You know, the last three years have been, been really important for us. Like where, where we've come and what I want to focus on now. Um, but the important part of knowing our process, I think really begins with our team. And so when I was you know, given the opportunity to participate with you all this evening from Babs and Kelly, um, I kind of had to circle back around and say, the more I think about what we'll talk about tonight, it really comes back to I can talk about jab all night long, but really what I'm talking about is the team. And some of my team are here tonight, um, and I got two of them up here. This is Chris Turnus, our in-house designer, and I've got Rick Mills, our senior project manager. And to be honest, I'm excited that they're here because probably a lot of the questions you all might have, I get to turn the mic on. What we do, this passion for what we're going for, really stems from this team culture we have. It all comes back to collaboration. And so there are three topics I want to kind of just share on. And to collaborate, we've got to be willing to advocate for who we're working with. We've got to be transparent, you know, with who we're working with. And we've really got to fine tune our process. I'll start with the advocacy. And that has been every meeting we have for our team, whether it's with a trade, with a client, with a designer or an architect, to start with how can we help. Normally when we get involved, we're getting involved in the process with maybe one or two different scenarios. It could be we're getting the first call from a client that's saying, I want to build a house or I want to renovate. What's next? And my first question is, what have you done so far? Have you started design? Um, and then you know, we go from there. The other option is, hey, we have design. We've been working on this and we need to start you know, talking to the builder. And, and so both of those potentially come back to the same process. Um, but it also it, it gives us the opportunity to advocate for the next step in there. The next step for us is design. It really is like the first step for us is design. And we're learning that we are moving towards a, a realm of design and build. Now I have an in-house designer. I know we're really upfront with that. 
And I'm gonna let Chris talk about his role because it's really been transformational for how we operate. And I, <laughs> <laughs> the reality of our company, our company's evolved over the last nine years. You know, Chris started out as a project manager for me, and he quickly pulled me aside and said, "This is not a good idea. Um, you know, I would be much better city somewhere else." I'm a terrible project manager. <laughs> <laughs> I say all that is we want to advocate. I go my way back to advocacy, and we want to advocate for and we are partnering with. Before we start partnering with, the first thing we want to advocate for is our client and the product and what we're going for. And so every conversation we want to start with, whether it's for our trades, for our client, the designer, the architect, it is our role here is to help. And I really believe that. We're the builder. Take three circles, architect, designer, and client. We have these three circles. I believe all those play a really important part. Builders aren't even involved in it. As those designs start to come together, you'll get some overlap. You know, really our priority is functioning in that overlap, where all three circles kind of merge together. We shouldn't be functioning without design. We shouldn't be functioning without architecture. We shouldn't be functioning without a client. We definitely won't function without a client. The one spec house, Chris and I went on that. I ended up falling in love with it and buying it. Chris did not make any money on that sale, and he'll never, you know, we won't do a spec again. But, um, so everything will have a client, designer, and architect, and what we do. Um, there are different ways to approach that process, but either way, my role as the builder, our team's role, is kind of functioning in that small little area where those circles all overlap together. And we try to fine tune the process that allows us to really protect that overlap. And it's really, it's not so much how we what we do, it's how we protect what else happening in these three different you know, circles and what's happening in the of that where they come together. Um, so advocacy is a big part of that. We want to push our clients to understand the value that everyone has in this process. Um, you know, even when I meet with a, a trade, my first question is, hey, how, how can we serve you? You know, Rick's job right now is hanging out with a lot of adults, and sometimes the grumpy ones, of, hey, today, how can, I, how can I serve you? How can I make you work and perform the best you can on the field, in the field? And he has to kind of juggle. It doesn't mean we meet every single request. Everyone wants that close parking spot to the front door, and we might not get it. Um, but he's got to juggle that. But we advocate for our trades, we advocate for our clients, we advocate for our designers and architects, that's what we're trying to do. The next thing I'll, I'll jump on is going to be transparency. Since day one, the one thing I realized was I have to be transparent in everything we do. And that means being honest in the good and the bad. And the reality is we make mistakes. Um, we're not a perfect builder. Um, we don't have perfect trades. Tell every client, you need to brace yourself, mistakes will be made process and this next whether it's a six month a one year two year three year build mistakes are going to be made um, i want to reassure you no one's going to fix a mistake faster than our team and we're going to we'll deal with it but don't be surprised when mistakes are made something will happen something might not make sense if i even get installed it'll get it'll get taken care of but be prepared mistakes will be made um, and, and we want to be transparent with that we're transparent with how we do our billing we're transparent with how we do our communication our scheduling we just learned that we want to establish these systems in place where clients feel like they're in control of their, their project. Um, I think that there's a, you know, we've experienced it with the clients in the past. Normally when clients come to us, we're coming with some baggage. That's what we kind of see. We have clients that are either really nervous about entering into another build, you know, build project or renovation because they've had a lot of hurt or frustration in the past. Typically it comes to two things, time and money. Either schedule is never met or the budget was blown. So those are going to be two areas that we really focus a lot of energy on. How do we protect these two categories of categories clients? So we want to be transparent with you. And um, that seems to be a breath, breath of uh, fresh air for a lot of our clients coming in, of um, having control of that. So we've, we've constantly figured out how can we you know, upgrade our transparency with clients. You know, they're allowed to see 24 hour access to billing to invoicing that's coming in, they know where they are with everything, they see our team communication you know, with each other, you know, in terms of daily job logs. Um, we're constantly trying to figure out how can we increase our accountability to our clients, as well as increase the level of transparency that we're doing. Um, I don't have a problem with a client knowing that we made a mistake, especially when we're gonna fix it. Um, but what I've learned is I lay my head down at night. Our team has enough stress as it is, you know, during the day in the field, whether it's design or in the field related, that the last thing we do is try to make in the day with wondering, gosh, we have to figure this out, clearing find this out. Um, we spend a heck of a lot of time in the beginning of earning trust, and I've learned it takes one little mistake to lose 
months and months, if not a year, of trust established. So we're, we're fine being completely open and honest and owning our own mess in this process. But we've learned the more transparent we are, the less we have to worry about just being real. Um, it allows us to be open with our billing and how we do trade agreements, how we do the pricing. I don't have to worry about when the way KW sends me over a quote, I don't have to, I just send it right over. Our clients see everything. And um, it's really enabled our communication to also increase and I think be well received with our clients and what we do. It also allows our trades to be themselves. I love that our clients get to interact with our trades. Most of our clients know our trades by name. Um, that might be normal for all of you all. I know a lot of it's not. Uh, we encourage our clients to get to know our trades in the process. Who's framing your house? Who's pulling wire? Who's you know running lines? All this stuff because they 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 take pride in what they do. But I also will bring our we'll bring our trades in on these meetings with our clients. And as we're walking through and someone says, I want to increase X, Y, or Z. I want to add this or that. You know, if we don't know, for the most part, we know where our trades are with the pricing. Um, and which, because of their transparency with us, but if not, we have no problem with people speaking over, which has only increased our communication levels, which has increased the transparency, which ultimately we have found has increased the, the client's comfort level of being honest with us as well, and feeling like again, this is their project. It's not a builder's project, it's not necessarily an architect's project, it's still their own. Our process is every client's different. And this might sound really complicated and really unprofessional, and every client's different, which means our process is also flexible. We have some clients that can't visualize a thing at all, even after they've entered into design with you all for months or years, and it's, we think we get it, we love it. Um, and then it gets to us, and we realize, if I pick up on any sort of reservation about something, we're gonna stop, and we've gotta dive into that. Um, we have, there's some, again, this is completely random thing. I love that art designer here is looking at pictures back here and he says, are these, are these our jobs? <laughs> I think these are our jobs. Um, unless Kelly's changed this, these are all projects we've kind of just we've done in the past, but uh, whether we know it or not. Um, but uh, um, we want clients to feel comfortable with what, they're, with what we're doing. And that, that ultimately, is, you know, for us is really diving into what we're building, what, yeah, what it's made of, what it's going to look like, um, how it's going to feel. Um, so I'll start with what it's made of. You know, we really, whether we have an architect involved or a designer involved, he's giving us plans this thick, which is like our dream, you know, plans this thick, um, or we're giving the six pages, you know, elevations, floor plans, and a cover page. Um, if that's what we're getting, then, uh, then we kind of have the next step for us is diving into what makes up this house. So for us, and this is where maybe we're not the best fit for every client, or architect, or designer, um, and we gotta own that. But we're gonna dive into the weeds a little bit on what's been put on paper. That's the first step for us as we get plans back. We're gonna dive into what's on the paper. I wanna know, um, it's not uncommon for us in the past to get plans that say, lap slide, um, that say, shake. Um, we have some that will then go into the fact that says, this is party lap slide. You know, this is the color. We, we'll get a lot of detail. We'll go into the details of the sheeting and the insulation. We also will get some that are just kind of left to the builder's interpretation. Um, and so we try to try to, you know, if we're given that, we want to dive back in the weeds. Either way, we're going to dive into what's being specified. And we've learned that, from our experience, there are kind of three categories that drive how a house is made, in my opinion. That's performance, it's comfort, and then there's finish. These are the three factors that we're really diving into the weeds with. Performance, comfort, and finish. More often than not, when we meet, whether it's for a prospective client, if it's an active client, we love talking about finish. Which is great. It's great. It's what everyone sees and they get to experience in their home. It's what reflects them, for the most part. Um, is what makes their home their home. What we really want to kind of take a, a break from, though, is prioritize. We've got to learn. And for the first, you know, early years, I, I kind of took the stance of it's your home, it's your priority. I'm here to make that happen. So if you prioritize finish over comfort and over performance, that's your right. And um, and we did some homes like that. Um, where we are now, in the last three years, of just kind of making some, some changes. I've learned that if a client's going to prioritize finish over comfort. They might not be a good fit for us. 
um, because I've had it. I learned through pain. I learned through, I learned real quick in pain. I've had a client prioritize finish despite all the number of conversations we have about comfort. I, I'm talking about being comfortable in your home. And it's 95 degrees outside and you want to be 67 degrees inside, which is doable, but there's a way to do that. If we don't prioritize comfort, it might not happen. And so when we revisit that of why is my house feeling this way, and we go back to do we want to invest in X, Y, and Z, um, there's selective memory. Um, and I think that it is just a, a part of our industry. Um, I know that because I also have it. I've been the client before. You know, I have, my, my, my wife and I have been the clients. We've done renovations before. I have, my, my employees have done stuff for us. My team has been like, we talked about this, Jackson. So I understand selective memory really well. And I know that's a real thing. And so I want to protect our clients from that. And so because of that, we've learned to kind of help educate our clients. It's not my role to prioritize a client's home. And I really believe that. But it is my role, I believe, as a builder to educate. And I never thought I'd be a teacher. Um, I have a history degree from the University of Virginia. I don't use it at all. I mean, I told my parents that I would be a teacher one day um, to get on my back, but I, I don't see myself as a teacher. However, I do see myself and our team rolling into the role of educator now because our clients, there's so much resources available to them online that they do self-education. And they will, they will know everything that it takes to do a lighting layout, but yet know nothing about it at all. <laughs> they will know everything about what material I want, but know nothing about how it behaves and how it performs. And I'm not saying that we have mastered that. I own that we're in an industry that's constantly evolving. New products are coming out, which means we have to constantly be evolving and willing to essentially challenge the things we knew yesterday. But it is our role, in my opinion, as the builder to verify what we're doing and what we're using. So when we get plans that are this thick, I mean, no offense to you all in the room, I do want to take a stance of understanding how do we get here? And, and that might, it has, it has pushed, you know, kind of rubbed some, some people the wrong way of your job is to build, it's not to, to understand. Um, and, and for me, it is important for us to understand how we get to a decision. I've been given plans that the whole goal of the plan is for a house to be net zero. And, you know, if everyone doesn't understand what net zero is, it's in the category of performance. But when I look at the plans, when we look at the plans, and we're diving through how do we, it will this perform if we're not near the performance, whether it's the installation package, the framing style, the materials that are being specified or not specified, we need to be willing to dive into that. And so we want to take the responsibility, we want to partner with the design side of the industry, take the responsibility to understand what's being specified. I tell everyone of my clients, it's my job to educate you on what you're picking, how it performs, how it's maintained, when will it fail, and how do we deal with it when it fails? Every product we use, we dive into that. Whether it is siding, whether it's sheathing, WRB, roofing, flooring, because here's the reality, we're gonna be the first one to use the phone call when it fails. And we wanna have this document, so we enjoy diving into the weeds on what are we picking and why. So I've gotta understand performance, comfort, finish. We go back to that all the time with clients. Rick in the field is constantly going back to why is why are we using this material? You know, where is there another alternative? Um, you know, Chris on his side of design is figuring out like, hey, should we specify this product or not? You know, even on jobs that we're not designing, Chris still will kind of get involved a little bit, and it's completely behind the scenes of just going through and, and checking. He helps us research products. He helps us understand just the performance of things. Because again, I take I tell our clients it's my job to educate you on what you were picking. We have some clients that don't understand what they're picking. They just, rightfully so, you know, they say, I like this product, I want this product. Great, I've had clients say, I want a copper roof. No question about it, that's what I'm getting. I love it. I love the way it patinas, and it looks completely different, you know, within a year, and what are you talking about? What do you mean it's a little different? I want the brightness, no, that's not gonna happen. And I'm so thankful that we talk about that because we would install a really nice roof that looks completely different, you know, would change it is to do a new roof every few months. And that's just not gonna happen. <laughs> um, so for us, we, you know, that, that's the beginning part of the process is diving into building material selections. But we, can, we gotta understand what's taking performance, comfort, and the finish. Performance and comfort, that's really what we dive into on the 
essentially the finishes of the um, flow. That's important to us and how the house performs. Um, finishes is a, is, a, is a touchy topic because that's normally what the clients really are, are prioritizing. And so when you have a client adamant about marble countertops, my first reaction is, I love it. I'm all about it. Let's do it. I love the way it ages. I love the way it's going to wear. It's going to reflect the way you've lived in the home. That's great news. You know, especially if we have nothing to do with it. When I hear about it, I'm like, I love this. But I also learned, I don't want to place marble countertops in a year or in a month or in two days. The clients that move in, two days after moving in, they have a party, and they've got citric acid being spread around marble, and it's edgy. And they're really upset about this. <laughs> um, and so it goes back to that education part of it for us. We want to make sure clients understand what they're getting. And I hadn't really been a part of a process that prioritized educating the clients on what they're getting. It goes back to also for me, learning through pain. A lot of the things that we implement and we stay true to are things that we did not do a good job of in early on in the years of educating clients, you know, or, or relying on manufacturer warranties. There are things that we do and that have been specified that are take a product that has a killer warranty on it, but we're installing a method that actually voids a warranty. It's up to us, in my opinion, to understand, does that void the warranty? We've got to dive into these products. I want to encourage the design community to design. Like, that's what you're good at. That's what you, like, your minds think differently than us. This is an intimidating room for contractors. I'm just that out of the way right now. Like, we're in here, we already look way more better dressed than we are. Like, y'all, but your minds think differently. Y'all can see things better than not just clients, but sometimes, sometimes builders. A lot of times builders, you know? Um, there are occasions that we might, we were going to butt heads, and we try to figure out, like, how do we make this design work? But I'm really excited because our team has this passion of protecting the integrity of the design. That's, that's one big difference for us. Is when we're given designs from you all, or if Chris has just poured his soul into a design, we don't take it for granted. And we don't take it as, as something we can easily tweak or alter. Or if we use this product, we're going to save a lot of money. Or if we just change this angle, it makes everything way easier. You know, if we lose this rating, I mean, the, the list is on and on, and these are things I'm easily being able to spout off, or things that have come up in discussion. Um, it also means when a client brings these things up, it seems like this radius is creating a lot of problem, or this radius is becoming really expensive. It's not, yeah, it is. Like our team's natural reaction is, we just gotta deal with this. We've gotta think through it, because if you lose this radius, you lose the design. This room completely changes. It's not just a curve, it's the character of this room. And you know, it sounds like we might understand it fully. All I know when it comes to the design part of it and what you all are creating and that in the all side of the process is that we don't know it all. That's the biggest thing. So us in the field, it's remembering that we didn't create this, but we're here to protect it. And so sometimes things have to be tweaked. Sometimes they have to be adjusted, but it's our manager's side it's our framers, and again, our trades are phenomenal when we to with. They want to fight for the design. They're not always looking out for, let me back up, because I know Chris is going to say something completely different. Um, <laughs> they fight for the design because we have a staff that teaches them to fight for the design. We have a, we have a staff that is essentially not allowing, we're going to take the easy way out of here. Um, whether it's in the performance of the home, the comfort of the home, the finish. Early on in the building industry or the building of job, we, we settle at times. And we're at a place right now where we don't want to settle. And I think that starts with actually you know, pushing our clients not to settle. Um, and I think that's what we spend a lot of our time doing. Um, a lot of times we see our clients possibly giving up before we do. And I love that we get to be an advocate for the design process. And not just the process, but actually what's the design to give to us to that new build. Um, I think I focused a lot of time on, I already have the mic longer than I anticipated. But um, that's just like our, yeah, that's just like our, our design process. Like that's just like kind of protecting the design. Pre-construction, um, for us, uh, I'll dive into this. I think there's one picture floating around of a random field with a bunch of two by fours in it. Um, it goes back to understanding, the moment we get a sense our clients not fully understand what's going on, we gotta stop. We'll pump the brakes, we'll stop. Whether we are having started framing yet, whether we're you know, halfway through the build, but we realize there's a disconnect. Um, what's not okay for us is for us to build something. This is my worst nightmare. And a client walk in, hmm, not what I expected, or it's different. Huh, is 
my worst enemy. <laughs> worst. So we want to we want to pump the brakes throughout the process and the construction process. I'm not looking to slow this build down at all, but I'm not looking. I'm not ever trying to speed this thing up to get it done. We want to make sure it's right. We have one opportunity in my mind to get it right. So we, we take a lot of time. That customer service side comes back into play. Of we read our clients really well, and I'm not probably a good builder for someone that's disconnected from a client or disconnected from, I'll say, a client representative. But I need, we need, you know, our team needs to be a part of the team that is understanding why we're doing what we're doing. And if not, we're just going to follow the plans. And the plans can be phenomenal, but sometimes there could be an adjustment, or sometimes the client might not fully totally understand. As crazy as it is. This curve here means the wall will be curved. You know, I've seen that before. Why is this wall curved? Because it's curved from the plans. What the whole point of it was. And so we really try to have a lot of walkthroughs. We try to have a lot of client interaction involved, where our clients are understanding the process along the way. Um, this picture, wherever it is, it, of a field is where we had a client on a job. We didn't. We weren't part of the design. We, you know, weren't, we were. We had to partner with the designer on it. But in a meeting, we can just tell the client, one of the clients was having a hard time understanding on paper what was really happening. And so that was an easy thing for us to do. I just say, hey, I need you to show up at this field in 48 hours. 48 hours, just come there, this will all make sense, and we'll figure it out. 48 hours, our client showed up to a field. In that field, the day before, we had a half a stud sliver. We were able to essentially mock up about 3,000 square feet of their home. We wrapped the walls in plastic to help them essentially drywall and see the separation between the rooms. And from there, we were able to walk through the rooms, had the window cutouts open to where she could, you know, both clients could understand the feel of the house, the stairwell, the foyer, and about half of their first floor, just to understand. But they, she was having a hard time figuring out how she wants her staircase working. This is before we really invest in digital design, too. Um, and from there, our client was able to walk through, and within 15 minutes, and I think out of just just courtesy, she stayed for about an hour. I think she felt bad. But within 15 minutes, she was able to say, oh my gosh, I don't like what has been drawn too deep. And, and the architect was there. Was, it, was, it was very much part of this process. I mean, it was, very, it was a, a strong collaboration for the, the client to say, I get it now. The husband was totally tracking what was happening on paper. She had a hard time. She had a hard time visualizing what is these, are these black lines on white paper meaning. And when we were actually able to elevate it and put her in that space, we were able to change the staircase layout, we lost the hallway, and we went back later and kept actually trying to calculate and told them later, like, what we ended up doing in one day saved you about 45 grand in change orders, and about, if we were moving really quickly, 30 days of just coming to a standstill. Because we didn't have to re-engineer and redesign the footings and the point loads the layout. We wouldn't have gotten to that point until really the foundation, the box, and the first four walls were up for her to walk through that. So mock-ups became a big thing. Um, mock-ups started for us in a much smaller scale. Rick had been working for us. We had a client that was having a hard time visualizing column. The drawing of it, hand sketch um, from, from potentially on the plans, and it just was having a hard time visualizing so we thought we could just build it out of some pine real quickly. And we had essentially parts that we could take apart and add different buildings in there and we quickly realized, gosh, there's a lot of power in mock-ups. So once we get to pre-construction, the moment we have a client that's ever having a hard time visualize something, well, for a while, we were actually building it, which is wild. But, um, but since then, Chris kind of wrote it, it into a different role that allows us to do some more things digitally and allow us to essentially mock things up digitally and put clients into homes or change the angles of orientations of homes and see. Um, you know, I'll let Chris talk more about the design process in particular questions that they all have for him. And then after we go into construction, I'm going to kind of just wrap this part up. Construction becomes a very intense, intense process of adult babysitting for us, for you know what Greg and Jeb and our other project managers here are doing. Um, it comes in a really intense process of client management and reading our clients and encouraging them to be on site. We want you on site. We want architects to be on site. Uh, we've been lately we've been working with architects, um, some that are out of town. And so our first question to them is once we get into construction, how do we make you be a part of this process? You know, how can you be here when you can't be here? Whether that's essentially photographs, FaceTime, emails, like how, how can you be a part of that? Because we need that community and collaboration. Um, and then, I mean, the construction process, I mean, before we wrap up, I'm summarizing this in like 30 seconds for what all, what all he's, he's doing here. But it, it's really, it's, there's a lot of lobbying in our trades. And 
making them really invest in the client's design and what we're doing here. Are there any, any particular questions I'll have at the moment? Yeah, Chris. How do you and your clients find each other? Mm, it's a great question. Um, right now, we are, I would say, 100% finding our, well, it's changing. Um, for a while, we take, you know, we, we dabble with Hal's. I'm like, oh, we have an account here, we'll get the leads. I never took a lead from Hal's. We got a lot of leads from there. We stopped marketing about eight years ago, and it really became word of mouth. But I would say 100% referral for the most part. Now, there's usually a personal connection. The fact that you're coming to us because you know one of our clients, this will make this a lot easier. Because you, you can call and say, is this really accurate? You know, are they really managing in this style? Can we expect this part of the process? Can we expect this level of accountability or transparency? Um, so four years ago, five years ago, it was hard. Um, I think the biggest thing we faced four or five years ago were, we had a lot of jobs that we were awarded, but not officially awarded because we were too young. It was, hey, we'd love to use you. Incredible proposal, really thorough. I love everything you're doing. You're just really young. There's no way you can do this. And we had to kind of sign up to it. Nothing I could do about that. I realized there's nothing. I can't age myself faster. Um, I can definitely stress myself a lot faster and get random gray hairs. But, um, um, but, but I would say 100%, uh, sorry, I'll tell you, 90% is going to be personal referrals of other clients in our community. Chris, I love it. I love it. Yes. What, what is the average size and kind of average price point of the Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a really good question. Um, actually, it actually sparks a really cool topic. I love. I need the answers on. <laughs> so I'm going to answer your question, and then I have a question for you all. I've been dying to know, and I'm honestly I'm too embarrassed to ask. So I'm going to ask all of you all. Um, I'm going to be <laughs> hydrated. <laughs> uh, we do a extremely wide range of projects. Extremely. Um, everyone's smiling. Just jackets. Um, now I would say, I try to be respectful of clients or, or perspectives of clients are calling us. And um, I never thought I'd be in this position, but I also am learning that it's okay to be in this position and that we have to just kind of own that in respect of one's time involved. Typically, and I tell a client, a you know, prospective client, is if we get a phone call, we're looking at doing a project, and I love hearing about it. Um, and the more I hear about it, I'll say, hey, let's let's talk about, you know, what you're what you're looking to do and your level of investment. Um, I I spent years never bringing up budget, never I learned from, I learned from pain. I had the most awkward conversation ever a prospective client when I asked, hey, where's your project? And I said, it doesn't matter what it is. So well, it kind of it kind of does because we don't work everywhere. You know, right now I can't work everywhere. And and the client apologized and realized, like, oh, I thought you meant if I say I'm building a big colony, for example, you're gonna jack the price up. So no, that's not what it's about. It's actually a realistic question. I was trying to understand could we are we working in your area? Are you gonna say that you're in Portsmouth? You know, um, it's not, I know it's not far away, but it's, <laughs> but it's just the way we, the way we operate and build, it might make it a challenge for us, the way that, the way we staff our projects. Um, I still have an interesting question to ask. <laughs> I don't know the answer. But, but I've learned, I've learned that we've got to talk about budget. And, and I, I've, I've stayed away from that for, I started a job in 2012, I've probably stayed away from that for at least seven or eight years. And I've learned that our value, this is how I say it, because I really believe it. I don't know if our value is really appreciated or might make sense on a project less than half a million dollars. Now, if a client says, great, I want to build a 3,000 square foot home and my budget's half a million, I will then deal with that. Um, so I don't have a, um, I don't have a range that necessarily answers that. What I'm more concerned about is just a client, are we a good fit for the client and what our process is? Because I don't know if I've said this or not, we're not a good fit for every client. We're not a good fit for every designer. Um, that's just like the, the brutal truth that I don't want to admit, but that's just part of the reality, is that we've had some people that don't want someone that's gonna dive into the weeds and, and, and try to educate. I just need to get it done. That's an easy way for me to realize I don't want to 
to just get it done. I want it to be done right, and I want it to be done right the first time, and I want it to meet the expectations. And that normally doesn't happen when it just needs to get done. Um, the average size of projects we're doing, let's just go ahead and get this out of the way right now. How many of y'all follow us on Instagram or follow Rick on Instagram? Great, one of you. This is fantastic. <laughs> We, we do a wide range of projects, so we do averages. Um, my accountant loves this too. What's the average size for a project? Well, this year it's this. Um, uh, we're doing a build right now that um, honestly I think is a really cool topic. I'm extremely blessed, and I mean that, to have a client that's been, for the most part, very transparent because they know our passion of actually trying to promote building practices and trying to learn through what we do and collaborate, and they've simply said, hey, this is a project, have at it, <laughs> post it. Like, like we, we don't do anything that's just on our own whim. They've given us a lot of, uh, of just uh, the permission to post, and, and from that has become a tremendous amount of collaboration. Um, and that's the project that Rick Mills is doing here. And Rick has had a heck of a I mean, process of this, of doing what he's doing. Um, that house in itself, I still, I don't know the square footage of it. I don't, it's big. I mean, they called the Jack on our build on Instagram. Um, I'm not gonna avoid it, you know, we try to at times, but that, it, it's there, and there are a lot of people that just have seen it, it's across from the arrows. I really, you know, I'll let Rick talk about that. <laughs> it's, 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 okay. Very large, very beautiful house. Yes, thank you. Um, I didn't personally build it, but he must have. It's a really neat project. This is the dream client, in my opinion. It's a client that values performance, comfort, and finish all in the same way. They really value just the, I'll say, the professionalism and the expertise that goes in from our team and from our trades, and they want a house that's going to stand the test of time. And that's going to be always be comfortable no matter what the conditions are outside. Um, it's going to be around forever. The thought of potentially multi-generations taking on this house I hope their kids like it. <laughs> um, uh, but that, that, I think, I mean, I introduced that project because it's one that we're allowed to talk about. Um, not every home we get to photograph, and I'm definitely not going to put on Instagram. That house is unique. Uh, we're going to square footage of that house. 13.5 under roof. 16.5. 16.5 under roof, okay. Um, that would be the outdoor living space. Okay, we'll leave it at that. It doesn't include all the outdoor living spaces that are under room, but it's the garages and the conditioned living spaces for the most part. Um, it is a house that I have no problem saying we probably will never get to do again. My hope is that we get to do that house, but maybe smaller square footage, but the same building practices. Um, the, uh, I can't share the cost of that project, Chris. Chris already did. They always have a question. He gave up way long ago. I wonder what my answer is going to be. Um, I'll, I'll wrap it up with this. We do a wide range. I more care about the client and what they're after, and if we're going to fit for that, pro and if it's our process to fit what they're looking for. I have no problem building a 1,500 square foot home. I would actually love to build a 1,500 square foot home that performs, you know, just incredibly. But most of our houses we're seeing, we have houses in, in design and that we're working towards. We've got people in this room that are designing them at this very moment, right? Yeah. And, uh, um, that are ranging from typically, I'll say 4,000 to whatever number we get through. And so we, and we, we kind of live with that, that range, and it's a huge range. Um, I, this is probably the only time, and I can share this because I share this with, with prospective clients, cost per square footage. And this is the question I want to ask you all. How do y'all calculate? I have a lot of clients in the first call, look, just get to it, what's your cost per square foot? I say, that's a great question. I will answer that question one time, and then we need to talk about that and what that answer is. Um, for us, I've never gotten an honest answer of like how we should be doing this, and honestly, I think I wanna, I wanna kind of revert to how you all do this. Cost per square foot. Do you all count? So I'll tell you what I say first to a client, a prospective client. I'll answer that question right now, and then we have a lot of other discussions to have to make sure we understand what that makes sense. When I calculate cost per square foot, I'm calculating cost under roof, under roof, not living space. And I have seen we get a lot of you know, different feedback from that. Well, no, we just want living space. And I said, I have no idea how to calculate that. I have no idea. Because we'll build houses that have a six car garage and 2,500 square foot outdoor living spaces and that are under roof and have you know whatever the unique facility is. 
um, rather than, you know, how, how, how do you calculate that? So how, do, how are you all calculating? Do you all talk cost per square foot with your clients at all? Ever? Yeah. Never? <laughs> yes. Okay. How do, you, how, do you all, how do you all do it? We're a structural engineer, so it's just the material and labor, so it's not as extensive. What number do you do? I'm just curious. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. But I, well, I we do all types of structures. So we do hospitals, office buildings, hotels. So it depends on the type of building. Yeah, so you're a little bit No, no, we don't have We have houses as well. It also is battering out the materials and everything. Yeah, it's, 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 it's difficult it, to very, engage. Gosh, great point. I'm telling every client right now, right off the bat, which is so <laughs> kind of nice to be able to say this, is if you need a schedule and if you need a, a budget, I'm not your builder, unfortunately. Um, but now that being said, I still provide a very detailed schedule in a very detailed budget that I have to explain why ahead of time we deviate from it and get approval for it. So you know, we, we primarily do all cost plus. That's kind of been the transformation for us the last three years. Everything goes cost plus. But with that, I say detailed budget. If I don't come to you ahead of time and say this is, you know, we're going to run into this issue and this is a change in price ahead of time, you don't pay it. If I don't, you know, if I turn the invoices worth 40 grand over on framing, and I have, we haven't had that conversation ahead of time, you don't pay it. That's my job as a builder, is to essentially be keeping you involved in the process you know, with our transparency in the building of, hey, we added another 2,000 square feet. By doing that, we're gonna add approximately X to the budget. We can go ahead and get started on that, and we'll keep this kind of a living budget document that we kind of keep revisiting, but you're not gonna get any, any surprises. Um, so that's a really good point. Thank you for bringing that up, because like, it takes, schedule and budget are out the window for us. Yeah, right. <laughs> But we're still accountable for it. It's still like, I think Rick spends so much of his time right now of answering questions and fielding questions with suppliers of when's it coming, what's the other schedule, and how does that trickle down through all the people coming behind them. Um, oh, cost per square foot, how do y'all do it? You didn't, you didn't really? Well, it just varies on the same structure. Okay, how do you do it, though? I do walls, so we do linear footage. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a lot of linear footage. Um, we have a lot of I'm not calculating that. I'm not doing that. Jeremy, how do you do it? Yeah. sub $300 a square foot. And there are a lot of incredible buildings that are at that rate, so I'm not trying to you know, take this away. I'm essentially saying we have found that our value in what we do and how we manage and how the expectations we set with our trades and for what we're trying to perform, performance, comfort, and finish of what we're doing, typically falls in that range. A client wanting to essentially build below that, there might be a way we can do it a little bit, but you're going to tell you you're going to sacrifice a lot in one of these categories, and most likely, in my professional opinion, you're not going to be happy. You're either going to sacrifice so much on the finish to get a build. I mean, I'm excited that you want to have a house that performs and is always comfortable. You can deal with finish later at times, certain things, you can face it. But you're going to, you're not, I, I mean, we turn down a lot of work sometimes saying, I really would encourage you 
there are other builders that can help you, I think, get to where you want to go. It's just a slightly different process. And I actually think you'd be happy at the end of the day. Um, so we, we, we're, we're learning to kind of try to you know, approach that. So Chris, that's kind of a really wide answer of, of where we operated. But I have some clients that are, and we built something that are below three hundred dollars a square foot, and they are they're just kind of like happiest clients. They just know, like they knew it. And when we do that, when we get to three hundred or sub three hundred, I start to get really nervous, mainly because I feel like the pressure's on for me to set the expectation. So when we start, when we're putting numbers out there, those are really important to me. Well, look, Chris gets to design, you all get to design. When it comes back to me and putting numbers on things, I mean, for a while we had a, you know. We haven't done in a while, but we used to kind of have like if we were entering into design, if we were designing for a client, the first thing we talk about are is budget. What's your budget? And they write it down. And if we cannot facilitate them through design within the budget they told us, we're explaining like now if you add another thousand square feet to this, it's going to change that number you told us in the beginning. But if we don't manage them through the design process and they're over budget, like that my firm can't build for it. We refund the whole design. We give them the plans, they go where they want, because I didn't do my end of it as the builder or partner through the design process. So even when I'm working with one of you all, and there's a budget that we're designed to build for, I'll still do that. You know, and we call it a feasibility study. We don't we don't bid. Um, I, don't, I didn't get a chance to put that in there. Right now we don't bid. I haven't gotten a set of plans. I haven't gotten one set of plans in the last 18 months that had enough information on there to ensure an apples to apples bid. And I think that's that's probably rare on the residential side, at least from my experience. I'm sure that's probably not the case on commercial because commercial I think thrives in the details. Um, but on the residential side, a lot of times it's kind of like, let's do a, a preliminary bid or a schematic set to kind of just give an idea of where we are. And I found that when we were participating in that, we were always left to interpretation to interpret what it is. I'm going to interpret the way I, I think would make the most sense and be the most efficient, most comfortable in your outcome. And we were essentially out outbidding ourselves. Um, or we were creating a document. I was for, for years sending, sending the architects and the client saying, hey, here are all the holes or things that could be interpreted differently. Please send them all to the builders and make a decision so everyone can bid apples to apples. So I don't want to deal with rebidding things on the road. And I found out that including a prospective client was like, you made this easy decision on our life not to use you. It's like, great. So that's great. Um, I'm glad that we're providing the service for free. Um, so right now we do a feasibility study is what we call it, of we can partner with a client and a designer, and if you have a budget in mind or that you're targeting, we can help kind of create checks and balances to avoid going to certain areas. Let's not explore a copper roof or a metal roof unless it's a priority because you're going to invest X in it, and we already know that the budget's tight. You know, let's not explore inset cabinets. Let's explore a full overlay. Let's find ways to be creative in what we do. Um, so we, we try to kind of be, be responsible in that part of the process. Um, but it's also my job at that point for us to realize, oh, we're going down a road that we can't perform at. So it's my job to say, hey, you can't have that, which is really hard for me. But I'd much rather have that part of the hard process and get a set of plans that have been extremely detailed out. And then when we bid on it, we're the ones delivering the bad news. And it's constantly, it's the builder that's crushing our dreams. You know, like we, we've been dead set on getting this and getting this and getting this. And then we're there to, to deliver the news that you gotta change your budget or change your design. So I just, for us right now, we try to we try to partner early on in the process with design. I think that's extremely worth investing in. Um, and if that's not a priority for the client, then we'll kind of stand stand back. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I want to take a minute to highlight, I think, a little bit more about that cost saving process. I'm gonna. Um, I'll let Chris, Chris, I'm going to let you kind of talk a little bit about how you got into this. <laughs> <laughs> you can feel all the questions from this time out here. Chris, don't worry, I have a hundred questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll start by saying I'm a lot more comfortable behind a computer than I am behind a microphone. So, uh, I, don't know, I apologize if this gets weird. But, uh, um, a little bit about my background, and I'm only going to talk about my background in respect to the fact that, say, I am truly proud of this, is that I am pretty comfortable having one foot on two different sides of, of, of a coin. And so all that is to say, I went to the University of Virginia for architecture school, 
Um, Google. I have a background in architecture. I worked for a couple of years for Habitat for Humanity, um, building homes. Um, I, I really wanted to get my hands dirty after I came out of architecture school. And then I did, I did a year of government consulting, which was terrible. <laughs> and I went back to graduate school. I went to Virginia Tech. So I'm a who and a who. Um, which should tell you that I'm really comfortable being on both sides of the coin. <laughs> I did graduate school at Tech. I have a degree in building construction and an MBA. So all that is to say, I know a little about a lot. I, I, I mentally was like, don't mess that up. I know a little about a lot of different things. One of the things that I, I am really proud of and, 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 and to be a part of this team is that I get to partner with people who know a lot more than I do in basically every capacity. Um, Rick is not here, so I feel free to speak about him. <laughs> but Rick is brilliant in what he does. I don't think there's a better project manager. I don't know a better project manager, so I can brag on him a little bit, but like he's phenomenal at everything that he does and the approach that he takes and the dedication that he has to both our client and also our trades. Um, and it's a very rare combination of, of skills. And so I learn from Rick every day. Uh, I get to learn from Jackson every day. Um, and I learn from our clients every day. It's, it's just, it's a fun process to go through. Um, and my role has, within Jackson Energy Building Design, has evolved over the years. I started as a project manager. I am a terrible project manager. Straight up, that is not my skill set. Um, but I did it, I did it for about a year and a half, and I came to Jackson and I said, you know, hey, uh, I really think I can help in a variety of different ways in terms of the office side and the administration side of the business. Um, and it took a little bit, it, 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 you know, we, we kind of put our heads together and we figured out what that role was gonna be. And I think it, it, it took off in a lot of ways. And that has evolved over the years, and so now I am, Part of the design side of Jackson Andrew Building Design. Um, I have a certification. I am not an architect. I am a certified professional building designer. It's issued through an organization that's the American Institute of Building Designers. Again, I am only as good as the team that is around me, um, and I genuinely mean that. And so, I get to partner with the, the, the client and the building side of our business to develop plans that, that hopefully we all find exceptional. It's fun when we get to do that. All that is to say, I really want to partner with architects. I'm not an architect. Come be part of our process. Like, truly, let me be an intermediary only in the sense that I'm gonna help. There are days that I just go out to the job sites and talk to our trades, and that only enhances our designs. You know, I can sit down with our framer and he'll look at something that I've drawn in 3D and he'll be like, that's a 712 pitch. And I'll be like, I have no idea how you knew that. But that absolutely is a 712 pitch, you know? And those guys are, in a lot of ways, the experts. And I just get to apply a lens to the process. Um, and the more that lens is reflective of what the client wants, and stays on target with what is buildable and what's practical, the better we create a cohesive product, you know, that is someone's house, that someone loves to be in and loves to experience. Um, and that's what I get to do every day. And so I'm, I'm, I'm ultimately incredibly thankful for the, for the team that we have because it allows me to be able to do that. What questions do you all have for us for our in-house design? How do we live in the yeah, that, I mean, I think that is a great question. Is how, how, how do we work with you all? And I saw your name, Chris. I was going to say, so do you design all the four points for clients? It has evolved over time. So we, we have, like Jackson said earlier, we have clients that come to us in various stages throughout the process. So sometimes they come to us and they say, you know, we, we're not sure what we want, and we can help them help facilitate some of that. And sometimes they come to us with a full set of plans. Um, Sometimes it's not a full set of plans. So, you know, it can be literally anything in between. And they say, you know, help us, help, help us. Um, and that's where it becomes fun because like Jackson said, we do get to dive into that and see 
help them understand, okay, what is it that you love? Whatever that might be. Sometimes it depends. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Rick. Uh, thanks for having us out. Uh, it's been a fun time. Um, mainly for my end as a project manager, I love all aspects of design from the structural engineering to the architecture to the landscaping to the finishes. I like putting that together and making that happen for the client, you know, and, and collaborating with all the other parts of that team. Uh, I really have a passion for building performance and what actually is to make a building function and indoor air quality, the HVAC systems. I feel like those are things that get missed and clients don't care about necessarily until it's too late. Um, and so uh, I think that circles back to Jackson talking about education and we, we like to talk early about clients talking about like what are your expectations for an HVAC system? Like what do you want to have your PC set at? And that really, sometimes that's your set temp, but really that could be humidity and how do you manage that? Um, that also comes down to building envelope, uh, windows, it could be all, all sorts of things, and I, I just enjoy being a part of that, kind of like weighing in on what's actually buildable, what can we do, looking at the plans and saying, you know, this works, this may not, how can we tweak that? Um, that's what I feel like my role is. Yeah. Like, underplayed. Really. <laughs> but, um, explain a little bit about the team that like, you know, as, as architects, we draw a you know, lot of our design decisions Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I've strived since since I got into construction. I started custom framing and moved into management, and the entire time I've tried to educate myself, find Home Building Magazine, JLC Magazine, like, read that. Now it's YouTube, um, but just how can you build better? And I learned from Steve Bates and Jack Jackson mentioned, if you, if you really want to build your house well and air seal it and control all of the, the layers, it's, it's the red pin test. Yeah. And you've got to be able to draw a line that's continuous around the building envelope. If you can't do that, you're in trouble. Um, so I, I think it comes down to just, you know, never stop learning. It's kind of one of those things. You, there, there's nobody knows it all, uh, but there's, there's a lot to know out there. Y'all talk about like, uh protecting the design and uh, how do you guys kind of carry that over to the trades? Because I know like trades, uh, working with them, they can be more about functionality than like, hey, I just, I need this to work. Yeah. So how, how do you kind of get them to kind of carry out protecting the design and keep that throughout the project? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I mean, you, you, a lot of times it's, with, with those guys, they're, they're typically a little hard-headed and you kind of have to make them, make them kind of come around to seeing it your way. Um, I think we have a, a great group of trades that we've worked with for years and they know how we like to do things. Um, we've kind of been selective about who we work with and who, who wants to come along on that process. And if you don't, you might not get called back on the next job. Uh, so I, I think that's really, it's really about getting find, finding good trades that want to be on board with your process. And the ones that don't, they're like, oh, this is how we've done it for you know 20 years. Well, we might have done it wrong for 20 years. Um, so that's that's where, where I'm at. Like we we have a really great team that we've worked with for a long time, and they every time every job they come on, they know how we're gonna do things and what our expectations are. Which change every job? Yeah, every job is unique, so the expectations are different. Yeah.